Welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Korver. Today, we are joined by Frans de Waal. Frans de Waal is a Dutch-American biologist and primatologist known for his work on the behavior and social intelligence of primates. He's professor in the psychology department of Emory University and director of the Living Link Center at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Since 2013, he's a distinguished professor at Utrecht University. His first book, Chimpanzee Politics, compared the schmoozing and scheming of chimpanzees involved in power struggles with that of human politicians. Ever since, the Waal has drawn parallels between primate and human behavior, from peacemaking and morality to culture. His popular books, translated into 20 languages, have made him one of the world's most visible primatologists. His latest books are The Age of Empathy, The Bonobo and the Atheist, Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are, and Mama's Last Hug. Two recent edited volumes are The Primate Mind and Evolved Morality. His latest research concerns empathy and cooperation, inequity aversion and social cognition in chimpanzees, bonobos, and other species. He and his students have pioneered studies on how behavior is culturally transmitted in the primates, where the elephants recognize themselves in mirrors, how primates react to unequal reward divisions, how well primates spontaneously cooperate, and where the bonobo orphans are as emotionally affected by their trauma as human orphans. I hope you enjoy this episode. Professor De Waal, welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. Thank you. Yes, great to have you here. So uh, very excited for this conversation. So let me just uh, dive straight into it. Could you maybe just provide a, a bit of background about yourself um, and then also maybe explain how did you get interested in researching sort of evolutionary approaches to morality and then moral behavior in primates more broadly? Well, I'm a biologist by training. I'm a Dutch biologist who lives already 40 years in the United States. So I'm also American. And um, uh, I'm an etologist. That word isn't used much anymore, but it's a behavioral biologist, mm -hmm. someone who studies the behavior of animals. And um, I, I'm specialized in the primates. And so, yes, I, I sometimes dabble in other animals and dabble in philosophy also sometimes. Um, but my specialization is primate behavior. And all my life, I've studied uh, mostly chimpanzees and bonobos, but also uh, a lot of monkey species. And um, I started out in the Netherlands, and then uh, I moved to Wisconsin, where I worked for 10 years. And, uh, and now I live in Atlanta. This, this is recorded from Stone Mountain uh, in Georgia. And so I live in Atlanta, and um, I've been teaching at Emory University. I've also been teaching at Utrecht University. And so that's where, uh, where I'm located. Oh, that's great. So today, you know, the big topic will be morality. Um, so you wrote a bunch of books, you know, related to this topic, I suppose. So, you know, a few I, uh, I managed to read, not all of them, <laughs> but so uh, uh, one of them being um, primates and philosophers, where you uh, explicitly also engage with some prominent uh, philosophers. Uh, then the age of empathy, then the bonobo and the atheist, and mama's last hug. So, uh, uh, yeah, many of my questions will sort of stem from these books, but obviously I know that there's more yeah, yeah. out there, but uh, you can uh, fill me in on that. Uh, but maybe just to start with a few big questions about how you sort of approach the topic of morality. So in your book, uh, Primates and Philosophers, How Morality Evolved, uh, one of the commentators uh, that is sort of introducing the topic uh, starts by saying that you, but also the other commentators, believe moral goodness is something real, about mm -hmm. which it is possible to make truth claims. So he's also saying that's already excluding a few people, such as the relativists, uh, that might not be uh, okay with that uh, claim. So maybe let's just start off with this very basic question. In what sense is moral goodness something real in your view? Yeah, yeah. Well, l let me explain how I got involved in the issue of morality, because it's not logical necessarily for a primatologist to get involved. And so um, I studied empathy. I, I actually st I studied what we call post-conflict behavior. Mm -hmm. So uh, when chimpanzees have a fight after the fight, lots of things happen, interesting things, like they reconcile after fights, they kiss and embrace each other, but they also console each other. So one of them has lost the fight, others come over and embrace and kiss and calm them down. And in the, in the 1990s, I saw a lecture by a, a psychologist, an American psychologist, who was studying empathy in children. And she said, what we do is we we look how they respond to distressed people. So if someone in the family cries, which was always fake, but the kids didn't know that, uh, if, if, a, if a family member cried, so how do the kids respond? And they respond in a very similar way to chimpanzees, they embrace and kiss and calm them down. Uh, and so um, she was saying that's, that's an empathy study. 
And when I heard that, I, I thought, well, I'm studying empathy too, because I'm studying the same behavior. And so that's how I got involved in empathy. And as soon as she started reading about empathy, uh, at the time in the 1990s already, uh, it was clear that that was connected with morality. For many people, for example, for the Dalai Lama, uh, morality can be entirely reduced to compassion. That's all, that's all you really need. You don't need much else for it. And so uh, empathy is always involved. Uh, I'm not saying it's, it's all there is to morality or that uh, you can reduce morality to empathy. I don't think that's the case. Um, but so, so I started thinking about the evolution of morality. And um, since I'm not a philosopher, I, I had to read a few things about that. And at the same time, there were very interesting psychological papers coming out by psychologists like Jonathan Haidt and other people who were saying that a lot of our morality is intuitive and emotional, a bit like David Hume's position, because you just mentioned um, Immanuel Kant. Kant would probably not agree with that, but Hume, Hume did say these things. And so uh, in, in that sense, I'm a Humean, I suppose, because I believe that uh, these very basic behavioral tendencies uh, that make us interested in others, because that's for me the thing is that I cannot see a human morality without being interested in others. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you don't resonate with others and you're, you're not interested in their situation and it doesn't do you anything, I'm not sure you can be a moral being. You can be a psychopath for sure, but mm -hmm. not a moral being necessarily. And so for me, um, I'm not sure that chimpanzees are moral beings. I'm not sure bonobos are moral beings. Or that's not my point. My point is that they have certain basic tendencies that we built into the moral systems. Well, that's very helpful. And, and one way how you sort of refer to us is as bipolar apes. So maybe explain, in what way are we bipolar apes? Well, I use that term because um, I feel we need to make a room for the bonobo as, as a model of the common ancestor. So humans derive not from chimps or bonobos. We derive from an ape that lived six to eight million years ago, um, from which also bonobos and chimpanzees derive. And, and they had as much evolution since that time as we had, a, a different one because we became bi, bipedal and, and big-brained and they didn't become that way. But um, it is not clear what that common ancestor was like. And... People always assume it's a chimp-like creature, meaning aggressive, male-dominated, territorial. That's the picture they have of that common ancestor. But the bonobo, which is exactly genetically equally close to us as the chimp, the bonobo is not like that at all. It's female-dominated, it's much gentler, it's not so territorial, don't kill each other, um, in the wild at least, and, and captivity neither. And so... Um, the bonobo is equally close to us. And but since the bonobo is so different, I, I started saying, well, maybe we are bipolar apes in the sense that we have a little bit of both. We, we have a little bit of the chimpanzee tendency, certainly in, let's say, male violence and uh, male solidarity, uh, which you can see in human society. But we also have a lot of the bonobo. We are a, a very sexy species. And so the bonobo is a very erotic character. So we have this sexiness and we have the tendency for female bonding, which is always ignored in the anthropological literature. They always talk about men being bonded and men doing things together. But women are very bonded in our species. And that's something you can recognize in the bonobo. And so I, that's why I call us a bipolar apis. We have a little bit of both. And it, for me, it's hard to choose with which one we should go. And we don't need to choose. We have two close relatives and we don't need to choose between those two. Mm -hmm. Now that's very helpful, and then we'll dive into some of the, the details uh, of that picture uh, later. But maybe just again to sketch the picture of like sort of the moral landscape, how you see it. So you sort of conceptualize, or at least uh, it looks to me, morality by sort of taking these two distinct levels. So on the one end, you talk about sort of one-on-one -on -one morality, but then you also talk about the sort of community uh, concern. So what is at stake at each of those levels? Yeah, one-on-one -on -one is, is the social relationships that you have with your family and friends, with your enemies also. Um, and, and that is, of course, a very basic level that we see in so many animals is that that's regulated, is that is regulated by dominance relations, by affiliative relations, like kinship relations. Um, and so um, a phenomenon like, let's say, reconciliation that I studied for a long time, 
where two parties who had a fight come together and then uh, kiss and embrace and groom or have sex as bonobos would do. Um, that's a one-on-one -on -one regulation of social relationships. And I think it's a very important, uh, important one. But in the primate groups, you can also see some sort of group level phenomena uh, where an individual, let's say a high ranking male, the alpha male maybe, uh, breaks up fights. He, and he's very even handed when he does that. It's, it's remarkable. These, these, all these primates, they're very biased, like we are. We, we defend our friends and our family, usually. But uh, a high-ranking male who does that, he's very even-handed. He, he doesn't necessarily defend his friend. If his friend beats up a female, he's going to defend the female <laughs> instead of his friend. And so um, we call that peacemaking behavior. Uh, or keeping order in the group, so to speak. It's a very important function. And the group itself contributes to that too. The group has rules and has limits. And so even the alpha male himself is subject to limits. So for example, you may have a situation where uh, a high-ranking male goes after a juvenile and, and, uh, and tries to catch the juvenile and tries to be aggressive. Uh, and, and the group will not agree with these things. The group may not mind him doing that with another male, adult male, but not with a juvenile uh, because they protect him. And so uh, the group sets limits to behavior and, and that gets us a little bit into morality because that's what morality of course does. It sets limits to the sort of behavior that we accept. Mm -hmm. well, that's very helpful. And again, like we'll take this in our later discussion just to get sort of to some of these foundations. So another thing that you already alluded to a little bit earlier uh, that you're sort of a, a, a union, right? In, in the sense of uh, uh, taking the, the, the primacy of effect uh, as it sometimes uh, it's called and therefore, you know, uh, taking that as more primary than what other people might uh, want to uh, uh, put in there, namely the primacy of reason or rationality uh, as such. So uh, how important is, is this sort of initial insight? Okay, there is this primacy of uh, effect uh, uh, and, and how certain are you of that claim? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, sure that, um, as I said, I, I don't think you can get to human morality without empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're not interested in other, you're not affected by their situation, it doesn't do you anything, which is what you would be if you're not empathetic. Y you cannot be a moral being, in my opinion. It's going to be impossible. And so even though uh, Kant would say, uh, oh, yeah, um, these feelings are beautiful, but <laughs> that's the word he used. They're beautiful, but they're no use in the moral system, so to speak. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. I think all these basic tendencies are necessary to become a, a moral being. You need to add things to it, and, yeah. and we can discuss what that would be. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you, you can get there completely with uh, just feelings. You're not mm -hmm. going to get there. Um, but I think they are essential. And so uh, the, what we talked to them, inter individual level, and then you have the group level. And of course, Darwin himself, he looked at morality as uh, a tendency in our species that promotes cooperation. Mm -hmm. It is intended to promote cooperation. And in my books, I usually say morality is, human morality at least, is mostly occupied with the community level. What, what kind of community are we going to have? Uh, what kind of behavior do we accept in the community? What kind of behavior we don't accept? Yeah. And so it's more occupied with the community level than with the individual level, even though our moral systems do recognize, of course, that we are selfish in general. We are generally selfish individuals. Uh, we feel in the moral systems that we need to emphasize how the community functions. And, and that's interesting that we can see a little bit of that in the primate groups as well, is that there are uh, certain tasks within the community, such as the, the peacemaking role that, that deal with the community level. So, for example, uh, a high-ranking female that, that I describe in my book, Mama's Last Hug, Mama, uh, she, she would um, bring parties together after fights. So if they were unable to reconcile on their own, she would go to one of these guys who had been fighting and she would make sure that he, uh, and she would pull at him to follow, to follow her. She would make sure that he would make up with his opponent. And so why would a female do that? She, she only runs risks uh, going to these males who are in a bad mood at that moment. So why, why would she even approach them? 
unless she is interested in fixing some problem in the community. And so she also had some interest in the community level and that her society in which she lives, and so there's a, there's a selfish interest involved. Uh, she lives in that society and she wants it to function as well as it can, you know? And, and then sort of uh, uh, taking another crucial idea. So while you sort of just mentioned, right? Like there is sort of this emphasis maybe on sort of the community level. When we talk about a, a famous distinction that usually gets uh, introduced and that you also wrote an article about between the is odd distinction, that seems to take it to the sort of individual deliberation perspective. Okay, the is odd distinction uh, is playing a role there, although uh, it might be framed also in sort of a community sense. Uh, but at first it seems to be sort of a, 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 a question about individual deliberation. Um, yeah. But many people like uh, uh, do think, you know, what's the role uh, or how could maybe biology clarify this distinction or where does play uh, biology a role? And then obviously uh, many people would say, well, it plays a role at the is uh, dimension, uh, uh, namely providing uh, descriptive effects. But you uh, think that it can actually provide uh, answers to, to both uh, uh, questions, although that has to be qualifi qualified in what sense. But maybe you could just elaborate on this distinction and uh, why you think uh, uh, biologists are not completely shut out uh, from the art uh, dimension. Yeah, so I, I sometimes read that, is that um, uh, biology is uh, descriptive, so to speak, and, and uh, human morality and human society is often prescriptive. And so that's the is-ought distinction, and, and it doesn't apply really to biology. Uh, I find that a very odd way of thinking because normativity is present everywhere in the, in the system. Even your temperature, your body temperature is a normative system. You have a sort of thermostat in your system that keeps a certain body temperature. Uh, and so um, if you look at, for example, structures like a, a spider web, a spider web is repaired. If you damage the spider web, the spider is gonna repair the web. If you damage it really badly, the spider is gonna abandon the web. But if you do a little bit of damage, it's gonna repair it. So the spider has an image of what the, the web should look like or how it should function. And uh, it's in that sense normative. So, so, so there's a certain norm of how the spider web should look. And I think in the social systems, we see the same thing. And that's where you get to the typical normativity of human morality is that if um, there's, for example, a fight and, and animals reconcile afterwards, and we know reconciliation occurs not just in chimps, occurs in basically all social mammals, uh, horses, uh, dolphins, uh, elephants, they all reconcile after fights. That means they have a sort of norm of how the relationship should look and how it should function. And it has been damaged, like the spider web, it has been damaged by a fight and it needs to be repaired. And so there's a normativity in there. There's a normativity in the social hierarchy. The, the hierarchies are found everywhere. Frogs have hierarchies, fish, chickens, the pecking order of the chickens. So hierarchies are found everywhere in the social systems of primates and other animals. And they are basically a normative system. You are a low ranking monkey and you approach my food and I'm a high ranking monkey. I'm going to beat you up because you're not supposed to do that. So I'm normative in that sense. I'm going to teach you how to behave because you're not behaving the right way. And so normativity can be found everywhere. Uh, we, did, we did experiments on, on the fairness principle in monkeys. So we, we looked at, would, would they object to unequal distributions of food? And they do. And so they're normative in that sense. In that sense, they, they expect an equal distribution of food. And if it's unequal, they're going to object to it. And so I think normativity is overrated in philosophy as a human characteristic. Uh, it, it, is, it is a beautiful human characteristic, but one that we share with, with a lot of biological systems and a lot of societies, other societies than human. Well, that's very helpful. I think now we got sort of a, a good picture uh, to sort of enter uh, maybe uh, some of the more specific questions. So uh, in your book, you also talk, and I think you introduced uh, this term like veneer uh, theory. Uh, uh, what is this theory and what does it say about morality and why do you strongly disagree with it? Yeah, it's funny that I sometimes see uh, people, people credit me with, with coming up with veneer theory as if I invented veneer theory uh, because I agree with it, but uh, but I invented the word because I disagree with <laughs> veneer theory. Veneer theory is something that came up in the 70s and 80s when, um, for example, Dawkins wrote The Selfies Gene, but there's, there's many other books that depicted humans as um, basically nasty and selfish. We, we are thoroughly selfish and competitive. That's all we are. 
And, and so the most famous saying in that time was scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. Meaning that whatever kind person you, you meet, it's not going to be honest. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot be honestly kind and you're going to be a hypocrite if you're, mm -hmm. if you're kind. Because real kindness doesn't exist. And so that's what I call the veneer theory is that um, our civilization and our morality uh, that we normally display in society is just a thin veneer. And below that veneer, you have this nasty human nature, which is uh, purely selfish and there's nothing good about it. Uh, I've also called it um, uh, Calvinist sociobiology <laughs> <laughs> because I'm from the Netherlands where, um, and, and I'm from the south of the Netherlands where the Catholics look at Calvinists like uh, they have a very somber picture of, of human nature. Human nature is is essentially dark, it's, it's black and dark. And, and with a little bit of effort uh, in your life, you can make it a little bit better, um, but it's essentially dark. And I don't agree with that at all. I think uh, we have nasty tendencies and selfish tendencies for sure. They're very well developed in the human species, uh, but we also have very altruistic tendencies and very social tendencies. Mm -hmm. We have both of them. And they are integrated in a very complex way. That's why you, it's hard to predict human behavior because we can go this way or that way, dependent on the circumstances and dependent on our education and our culture and so on. Uh, and so it, it's, uh, human behavior is harder to predict than a lot of animal behavior yeah. because we have these conflicting tendencies in us. Mm -hmm. and, and you also trace, I, I, because actually uh, Wikipedia does credit you, I think, with uh, the term uh, veneer theory, uh, yeah. I, I noticed. But uh, good to, to set the record straight there, I suppose. But like with uh, you also track it sort of back to Huxley, right? Like a contemporary of uh, Darwin. And then you also uh, actually, you know, trace this further to uh, ultimately claims by, for example, uh, Dawkins. And just sort of to illustrate, I guess, for people like what Dawkins is really uh, claiming. And I quote you quoting him uh, saying... What I am saying, along with many other people, among them T.H. Huxley, is that in our political and social life, we are entitled to throw out Darwinism, to say we don't want to live in a Darwinian world. So that seems to be quite a, a strong uh, claim. And you obviously object against this because, you know, you say uh, yourself, Darwin must be turning in his grave. Um, so like maybe just, you know, uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 characterize this a bit further, like how, how widely is this still held? And, and uh, obviously you already indicated a few problems uh, with it, but why does it still remain such a strong claim by many people? Yeah, so, so yeah, Dawkins claims to be Darwinian, but then he throws Darwin under the bus, so to speak, at the critical moment when, it, when we talk about kindness and altruism and so on. And uh, Darwin was a much broader thinker mm -hmm. than, than all of them together. And, and Huxley, who was his contemporary, uh, who is known as Darwin's bulldog, Huxley was very effective at defending evolutionary theory uh, uh, for the masses. And so he did that very effectively, and Darwin, I suppose, was very grateful. But they agreed fundamentally on morality. So uh, Huxley thought, like Dawkins, and I consider Dawkins Huxley and not Darwinian, mm -hmm. uh, Huxley thought that human nature was so bad and so dark uh, that it could never have produced morality. Morality was something that came later and was uh, cultural uh, uh, and, and was, had nothing to do with biology. Whereas Darwin in The Descent of Man clearly tried to anchor morality in human nature and human biology. And so they dis disagreed fundamentally on that point. Uh, uh, Darwin did know about uh, affiliative relationships in animals, and he talked about how sympathy, that's the word they used at the time for empathy, how sympathy was at the basis of, of human morality and, and, and was something we shared with other primates. And so um, when Dawkins started writing The Selfish Gene, in many ways he was completely right uh, from the genetic perspective, but to call genes selfish was immediately started causing confusion. And even though he would say himself, I don't mean it literally, I mean it metaphorically, that, that's what he would say, of course. Um, it was taken literally by quite a few people. And in his own writing, you sometimes see sentences such as the sentence you just produced. Um, you sometimes see sentences where he tries to have it both ways. He, he's, mm. he's, he's calling genes metaphorically selfish, but he also really believes that we humans have a selfish nature and that you cannot expect from humans uh, by natural means 
uh, altruistic behavior. And so Darwin, I consider a much broader thinker who um, tried to place morality in human biology and tried to see it as a way of keeping society together and have highly cooperative societies. And, and of course, nowadays, if you read the literature by anthropologists or economists uh, or uh, people who, who talk about human evolution, nowadays we emphasize cooperation very much. Mm. So cooperation is, is very much at the forefront of the discussion of human, human behavior. But in, the in that time, in the 70s and 80s, it was, in my view, all Huxleyan thinking, a very mm. dark, um, pessimistic Huxleyan and cynical Huxleyan thinking was very prominent at the time. Well, that's very interesting, sort of this this, this cultural uh, shift uh, as well, um, yeah. uh, I suppose. And and then one thing you also uh, uh, mentioned, which I thought was sort of relevant and interesting, is like sort of how do we think about what constitutes uh, morality? And um, so many people might look at you know the behavior that gets manifested and sort of make uh, moral conclusions from that. But you also say let's look at the actual underlying capacities instead of just the behavior as such. So yeah. you gave the example, and uh, I'm sort of just using it here, namely of food sharing. And so, you know, people could say, well, food sharing, that's obviously an important ingredient uh, that sort of facilitates uh, uh, what we would interpret as moral uh, behavior. But you think it's much more, uh, I think, explanatory helpful, uh, I suppose, to actually look at the capacities that underlie sort of uh, food sharing. And here you mentioned, for example, high low level uh, levels of tolerance, sensitivity to others' needs, and sort of uh, reciprocal uh, exchange. So... It seems to me an important point, but uh, uh, could you maybe just hammer this point? Like, okay, why is it important to focus on capacities instead of just looking at sort of uh, behavior? Yeah, uh, food sharing is interesting because uh, in species that do that, such as chimpanzees and capuchin monkeys and, uh, and some of the social carnivores who share, um, there's also an expectation of sharing. So uh, uh, they, you will be, if you have meat or, or attractive food, you will be approached by others who beg and, and, and if you don't give it to them, uh, they're gonna throw a tantrum and they're gonna be mad at you. And, and so there's expectations of sharing. And uh, I've studied food sharing uh, for many years, looking at the reciprocity side of it. So, so you can actually demonstrate that if I share a lot with you, it's very likely you're gonna share a lot with me. So there's a reciprocity. And reciprocity is, in humans is regulated by moral obligations. If, if let's say I'm, I help you move your piano, which is a very strenuous job. Uh, and, and two weeks later, um, um, I approach you because I'm moving and I, I need to move some heavy furniture. And you say, no, I don't believe in reciprocity. Uh, I, I don't do that kind of stuff. You, you did it, but that doesn't mean that I have to do it, something like that. Uh, that would be so disappointing and would be morally disappointing that, that you don't believe in reciprocity. That, that's sort of a fundamental part of human society. And in the primates, it's very easy to demonstrate reciprocity. Um, the, 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 there are many naturalistic studies that have tried to do so, but nowadays there are experimental studies that show reciprocity in primate, primate societies. And I think there are some expectations involved. I'm not saying that it's morally regulated, but um, it, it, is, it, it has a lot in common, I think, with, with human reciprocity. And maybe one uh, sort of additional point uh, worth mentioning, like across your work, you so sometimes also uh, negatively uh, talk about sort of uh, a broadly behaviorist stance, right? Like where it's all just about behavior and that's supposed to uh, 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 answer uh, these uh, uh, questions, right? And, and um, uh, maybe you could just say a word about why you find that <laughs> a, a very uh, problematic approach. Yeah, the behaviorists, uh, there was Skinner and so on, you know, uh... I consider that a dark time in the study of animal intelligence in the sense that the behaviorists try to reduce everything to very simple learning mechanisms, very simple associative learning. And they felt that could explain everything that animals do. Uh, and, and it didn't matter for them what kind of animal. If you talk about an elephant or a rat, it doesn't really matter. That It's all the same for them. It's all associative learning. And um, I found that a very poor way of looking at things also very non-biological because why would an elephant and a rat be basically similar in these, uh, these mechanisms? Uh, and um, I sometimes compare it with what we had as etologists. The, the etologists, and I'm trained as an etologist, we had the instincts and we always talked about the instincts. Uh, 
we were not allowed to talk about emotions. We, we, we were allowed to talk about uh, uh, motivational systems, which in my opinion, very often the emotions are. Um, but we had, we had these sets of instincts that we talked about and the behaviorists talked about associative learning. And so we, we both had a sort of mechanistic view of the animal. And, and fortunately that is now disappearing. Fortunately, we have so much evidence for complex cognition in so many animals now yeah. that, that these, these ideas have completely lost their appeal. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It's not wrong to say that animals have instincts and it's mm -hmm. not wrong to say that associative learning is important. It is absolutely important also in humans. Um, but to try to reduce everything to that, that's the problem, is to try to simplify things and to, to have a mechanistic sort of a, the animal as machine. And, and, and then you get to split, you know, um, the behaviorists, of course, initially applied their ideas also to humans. But in the 60s and 70s, uh, the psychologists insisted that humans have cognition that goes beyond associative learning. And so they dropped the humans from their picture. The, the humans were dropped, but they doubled down on the animals and the animals were certainly associative learners. And so then you got this split that, that is never satisfactory for a biologist to, 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 to put humans on a pedestal and, and, and to say humans are totally different from what the animals do. Um, that's not something that flies very well with a biologist. And, and then maybe one thing that gets sort of discussed a lot uh, uh, nowadays in, in philosophy, but also uh, philosophy of science, I suppose, is sort of the, the term naturalistic. So uh, you also advocate for a naturalistic theory of uh, uh, morality. Uh, some people sort of interpret that term from sort of a, a methodological stance, uh, what that exactly uh, amounts to. Maybe just from your perspective, how do you, if you find that relevant, like substantiate this notion of naturalistic? I don't know what that means, naturalistic. Mm. You, you, you have natural behavior, which we usually apply to animals in the wild. That's where they show their natural behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, you can say we keep animals in under naturalistic circumstances, which usually means that we try to imitate mm. their natural environment. So we give them a big piece of forest, for example, and that looks a little bit like their natural environment. But naturalistic behavior is not a term that we use in biology very much. So... Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, I would prefer the term evolutionary. If you if you want to go full blown uh, bio in, in biology of morality, you're going to try to give an evolutionary explanation of why why do we humans all human societies have moral systems? So, so why do we have them? Uh, why 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 did we evolve these tendencies to be? So, uh, so strict on the rules because because we're quite we, there are species that that keeps an eye very closely on everyone and and we are very strict about what you do and what you cannot do uh, and why did how did we become that way uh, and and are there certain adaptations that we have in our uh, mind so to speak to to make these very sharp distinctions between right and wrong and to to have feelings of guilt and shame associated with these things mm -hmm. uh, to internalize this whole rule system in us, where do these tendencies come from and what do they do for us? So, so for example, one thing that, that we speculated on one time and, and Darwin already speculated about, why do humans blush, for example? That, I always found that a very interesting, that's, a, that's clearly an adaptation. We blush, we, I think we're the only primates who blush, who turn red under certain circumstances. There, there are primates who turn red in certain seasons or uh, when females are fertile or things like that's not the same thing. We turn red under very specific social circumstances when we are embarrassed uh, and when we feel everyone is watching us and so on. Um, and so uh, th that's for me is, a, is an interesting question associated with the natural tendencies of humans to be moral beings that we can be embarrassed, that it shows up in our face meaning that we signal to everyone in our environment, we are embarrassed. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, why would we do that? Why not keep it hidden? Is that not better to keep it hidden? And so Darwin already speculated about it and some people have speculated. Uh, and, and I think it's possible that we get benefits from signaling that we are sensitive to the rules of our society. Mm. Uh, so, so if you're looking for a partner to work with, You'd rather have a partner who signals his emotions, uh, 
and who signals that he's honest and, and embarrassed if he's dis- caught, a, caught being dishonest. Uh, so, so it may be a signal to others what kind of person you are, what kind of personality you have, and, and we benefit from those signals. No, that, that's very interesting. And, and then maybe moving to the topic of like altruism, which is like obviously a very uh, big uh, topic. So uh, here you sort of, uh, the discussion is uh, often around sort of these different notions, selfishness uh, uh, and altruism. Uh, um, um. So you say that there's also an immense gray area uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, on this topic, I suppose. So then the question would be, well, how do we sort of navigate uh, 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 this this notion of altruism that is worth wanting? And then maybe could you just also run us through some of the evidence for animal uh, altruism? I mean, obviously you've already been uh, 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 giving a few examples there, but then also people talk about the puzzle of uh, altruism. Um, And lastly, I see also in your work a a, a whole different uh, set of different versions of altruism uh, being mentioned, self-protective altruism, low-cost altruism, biological altruism, psychological altruism. So uh, how do we we make sense of this? (laughs) Well, the the more I think about it, the more I think it's actually a distinction, selfish and and altruistic, that is like a red herring that Mm. that doesn't do much good for us. We, We have made this sharp distinction and then we discuss the puzzle of altruism and we say it's so puzzling that animals would, would help each other. And um, we le- in that discussion, we leave out usually the most common and most pervasive and, and strongest form of altruism, which is that of female mammals for their young. We leave that out because it's not puzzling enough, of course. <laughs> But of course, these, these females need to take care of their young. Otherwise, they would not be in existence, even mm-hmm. if, if, they, if they didn't do that. And so um, we leave that out. But I think the whole blueprint print of human, the neural blueprint of human altruism is actually maternal care. Is the females respond to the distress calls of their young when they're hungry, when they're in danger, when they're cold. They respond immediately with comforting contact. Um, and they have to do that. And uh, that's why, for example, empathy in all the empathy studies, females have more of it than males. Mm. Uh, empathy is regulated by oxytocin, which is per excellence a, a maternal hormone. Um, I, I think maternal care is where everything started also in the brain and in mm. the physiology of the human. Uh, and then um, once that mechanism existed of empathy and, and care for others, it could be expanded to others. It could be expanded to non-kin and it could be expanded even to strangers. But most of the time it's directed at friends and family. Uh, and, and that's the context in which it evolved. And to, to talk about a contrast with selfishness is, is, in my opinion, misleading. The thing is that being altruistic, being kind has what... What, what is sometimes called a warm glow effect. You do something good for others, you feel good inside. Yeah. And, and I always think that is similar to all the things that we need to do. Biology has made self-rewarding everything you need to do. You need to eat, and so eating is self-rewarding. You need to have sex, so sex is self-rewarding. You need to nurse your babies, so nursing is self-rewarding. You need to help each other if you live in a society. Yes, because otherwise, why would you live in a society if you don't help each other? So you need to help each other, and so you feel good when you help each other. And so to make a distinction between selfishness and altruism is going to be tough under circumstances where many forms of altruism are actually self-rewarding. Uh, and so um, I think we are naturally social beings. We are highly social primates. And, and so we are naturally helping each other. Um, we usually get benefits back for doing that, either, either genetically or uh, reciprocal, uh, reciprocally. And so uh, we get benefits back usually on average. It doesn't need to be every time. Um, and so I, I remember one time, uh, discussing um, uh, altruism that went beyond the usual patterns. So, so typical altruism in, in chimpanzees is directed at your friends and your family. For others, you usually don't do much, and chimps can be very hostile to strangers, for example. 
But we have had cases where um, altruism occurred, where really the benefits were not in sight. So for example, we had an old female named Penny who could not walk anymore. She could barely walk and, and she was also getting blind. She was a very high ranking female and she had always been the kindest alpha female when she was younger. And uh, in the end, the, the last year of her life, we saw very interesting scenes where younger females, adult females, would uh, help her out. So, so for example, if Penny would walk in the direction of the water faucet where she would drink water, these younger females would rush ahead of her, suck up a lot of water, then return to her and she would open her mouth and they would spit it in her mouth. So, so, so they were bringing her water. Or if she tried to join others in a climbing structure where the others were grooming and sitting around and she could not climb anymore, uh, the, the younger females would push her up in the climbing frame, would push her up until she sat there. And, and I found that so interesting because Penny was not in a situation that she could repay them. She, she, she was very dependent. Uh, and so she was not in a situation that she could help them in return, but it's, it's almost as if they were repaying her for her long life as a very nice alpha female. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I always find these cases very interesting because a lot of altruism that we see in primate societies, you can explain in terms of you will get back favors or it's your kin mm -hmm. and so on. We can explain that in other ways, but there are very often cases that are very hard to explain. So for example, in the wild, Chimpanzees sometimes help each other against leopards. Mm -hmm. So a chimpanzee gets attacked by a leopard, has a special scream of distress that the others probably recognize what is going on, and they come to, to help and chase off the leopard, which is a very dangerous thing. To, that's a very strong animal. It's a very dangerous animal. So, so they take a very high risk. Uh, there are also cases of chimpanzees trying to save a drowning uh, other chimp. The chimps don't swim. Yeah. And so to try to save someone who's drowning is a very dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so there are forms of altruism that I think will never be repaid, that are so risky or are done to individuals who cannot repay them. Uh, and so they do occur. Uh, and I find that very interesting. But I think it's all based in that very basic mammalian system, uh, which goes back to maternal care, uh, which is that you take, take care of distressed individuals. Uh, and usually in, in maternal care, it's of course your own young, so that's not puzzling at all, but mm -hmm. uh, that whole system has been expanded to other individuals. That's fine. So, so maybe moving uh, to a topic you already mentioned and that you wrote like an entire book about, namely the age of uh, empathy. So empathy, obviously a, a very important area of research. And uh, I think somewhere in the book, it also mentions that you were asked, you know, or you mentioned, you know, if I were God, I work on the reach of empathy. <laughs> so uh, uh, why is that? <laughs> Yeah, empathy is, um, you know, Paul Bloom wrote a, a book yeah. about uh, Against Empathy, yeah. I believe was the title. And um, that empathy is parochial. Uh, empathy is biased. Yeah. And that's true for all the animal studies too, is that empathy uh, is, is most easily aroused for individuals who are similar and familiar. Yeah. So we have trouble having empathy for people of other races or other cultural groups or other languages. Um, we, 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 we are biased in the same way. And that makes empathy not the best guide for uh, morality. I think it's essential. And I think that's why I would disagree with Paul Bloom. It's, mm -hmm. You have to have it, the capacity for empathy. Um, but um, it, it would, if you take that as the only guideline, it would lead to a very um, narrow view of, of morality. Uh, so, for example, uh, I admire for the, for the human species that we have, for example, the G Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions ask us to treat our enemies during war, to treat them uh, humanely. Now, clearly, humans don't always do that. And I think the natural tendency for humans is to kill them or to torture them. Um, but we have made rules that you're not supposed to do that, which is truly remarkable because that's not... That's not something grounded in human biology. Human biology is not that you take care of your enemies. That's, no, I don't, think, I don't think any animal has that kind of rule. Mm -hmm. But we developed that kind of rule. And that, that shows that sometimes our cognitive systems of morality, our cognitive approach to morality over, overtakes the other approaches and, and, and becomes more dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, as we would say, it's more like a top-down view yeah. of, of 
cognition and morality. Yeah. And, and um, uh, I, I think that um, such, such tendencies as a sort of generalized moral tendencies where we take care of individuals that normally we would biologically not take care of uh, is very special uh, in our species. Mm-hmm. Actually, one question that comes to mind. So when people talk about so like uh, 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 expanding the moral circle, like as it's sometimes sort of referred, you do think like empathy can still help it sort of expanding that circle, but you do, do also just sort of acknowledge there's sort of the darker side where there might be limits where we have to refine it in, in other ways. Uh, would that be fair? Yeah, uh, th- th- we, we do. We do sometimes take care of individuals that we absolutely don't know. Mm-hmm. You see that a little bit in the reactions to immigrants, for example. So uh, Europe has taken care of like like a million or more immigrants over the last couple of years. I think we've reached a limit. I can see that people don't want to do much more than that. But it's remarkable that, that and that was all based on empathy, I think. Mm-hmm. These poor people streamed into Europe and they were uh, received. And, and yes, there are limits to what we can do or want to do. And we see these limits in the US also with the Im- immigration question. Um, but that's um, an expansion of the, of the empathy circle mm-hmm. is that strangers knock on your door and you let them in, uh, which is I, again, not something that I think we are biologically programmed for, but we, we can do those things. And so we, we have this capacity to expand empathy Once the the capacity for empathy exists, it can be applied outside of your little circle. It can be even applied outside of your species. So we see a stranded whale, we're gonna push it back into the ocean. Again, that's not something that empathy was intended for by evolution. That's not something what it evolved for. And and under different circumstances, we would probably not push the whale back, but would eat the whale or something like that. So uh, it's not necessarily what we we evolved to do, uh, but it's an an expansion of a natural tendency. And under these circumstances, we apply that. And and I think we do often apply it to other species. Mm -hmm. Uh, So with our pets, we certainly do that, yeah. And sometimes just to, to, to further dive into this, this notion of empathy, I suppose. So many people might think about uh, 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 empathy in the sense that it would require imagination. Uh, uh, you sort of, again, you usually don't like this uh, top-down approach. You prefer to uh, go bottom-up, uh, right? And, and here you use uh, 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 talking about sort of a, a Russian doll where empathy can be yeah. sort of multi-layered and, and complex, right? So what is the starting point of empathy? And when do we get to that highest level where imagination starts to play a role? Yeah, so, so um, in psychology, there was a tendency to explain empathy as putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else. Yeah. You, you imagine the situation of somebody else, a very cognitive view of empathy. And, and for that reason, when, when I said that I think primates, other primates have empathy, they were very uh, dismissive of it. They didn't want to hear that because they said, we don't have evidence that, em- that animals can imagine the situation of somebody else because they were very focused on that. Uh, But then all sorts of research came out, for example, on humans, research came out uh, that showed that we we automatically mimic the facial expressions of others and we we are affected by that. We we don't do that consciously. You're talking with a sad person, you will have a sad expression on your face. You talk with a laughing and happy person, you will have a happy expression on your face. We mimic facial mimicry and it affects our mood. It affects how we feel. And so all of a sudden in humans, it became clear that empathy is maybe regulated by these body mimicry uh, motor neurons, people would, would bring that in also, uh, that bo- body mimicry is part of empathy and that it's automated, it's involuntary. It's not even regulated by these higher cognitive processes of imagination. And so um, as a result of, of this shift in thinking about human empathy, animal empathy became also more acceptable because animals clearly, most animals have this kind of automated relationship with each other. And so um, I think that's where it starts in what we usually call emotional contagion. That's how empathy starts and also how it starts in human life. Uh, For example, babies will cry when they hear other babies cry and that's emotional contagion right there at at a very early age. And so that's how things get started. Uh, 
And then the older you get as humans, the more these complex cognitions come in. So not, you're not only going to be affected by the emotional state of others, you want to understand where it comes from. You want to understand why they feel this way. And, and you want to imagine, would I feel the same way under the same circumstances and, and so on. And, and that's where you develop these higher levels of empathy. Mm-hmm. And the highest level is when you don't even need to see a person. You, you read a, a novel about a character and you empathize with the character, you identify with the character. Uh, that's a, a very abstract and high level of empathy uh, where you don't even have that immediate physical uh, contact. And, 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 and so d- during the COVID crisis, for example, we have seen how important these physical processes are between us. So um, we thought that we could replace all that human contact that we have with digital contact, yeah. like what we have now, the, the Zoom uh, connection. But um, in the periods that COVID has diminished, Uh, which is now unfortunately over at this point. Uh, But in these periods where we could have physical proximity to others, we were very relieved. And that is because in physical proximity, you smell others. We always underestimate the role of smell in human contact. You see others up close. You hear their voice and their voice timbre. You hear hear it better. So we, we missed that kind of physical presence of others, which I think is very important for our interactions. And so that's the basic form of empathy, is, is, is the, the empathy that occurs in immediate physical contact with others. Um, and imagination and cognition is a sort of second layer. And it is not completely independent. And that's why I have this Russian doll model mm-hmm. is that it builds on top of the others. Uh, it's not completely independent, but um, you could study it in, as independent. It, it has some independent qualities for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and and then maybe uh, you already mentioned also your research on on, on uh, fairness, uh, uh, right? So and and you sort of make a uh, uh, because you use in some sense right defend or as, as some people say you defend uh, emotions such as uh, uh, empathy, uh, right? But with fairness you have a slightly different interpretation. So uh, uh, just to sort of contrast that to a uh, uh, famous political philosopher from the 20th century that uh, Rawls uh, that talks about justice as fairness, uh, but. Here, when you get to sort of the point about fairness, you say, all I see is self-interest. <laughs> so that might uh, surprise uh, quite a few people uh, why that is so. Um, so yeah, maybe why is that your interpretation of, of fairness? Yeah, Rawls, John Rawls, he, he tried to keep the emotions out of his book. You know, he, he, uh, he tried to explain uh, the sense of fairness and justice Uh, as a completely, uh, as as a Kantian, as a completely sort of rational decision. Uh, It's the best for society and it's the best for me and it's the best for everyone or something like that. Um, And so uh, an emotion like envy uh, or jealousy or whatever we call it, resentment, you know, uh, getting less than somebody else. uh, So that kind of emotion, he, he literally says he wants to keep it out of there. Whereas I would say, Put it in there. That's that's what explains how we react this way. So if if um, if you get a, a much better deal for something than I do, uh, I may be envious, and that that may create a situation where either you abandon part of your deal and you share it with me, or where we equalize the outcome. So so in our fairness study with the monkeys, the initial fairness study we found that a monkey will get very upset if it gets less quality food than another monkey. So so one monkey gets cucumber slices, the other monkey gets grapes, and the monkey who gets cucumber slices, even though normally that food is completely acceptable and eaten, um, when the other one is getting grapes, that monkey gets very upset and objects to the division. In chimpanzees, we get much closer to what humans do. In chimpanzees, the one who gets the grape may refuse the grape till the other one also gets a grape. So the one who has the better deal is also trying to equalize things. And um, and that is, I think, because chimpanzees, just like humans, they understand the consequences of behavior much better. They understand that if they take much better food than the other, the other is gonna, gonna be pissed off, is gonna be upset. Yeah, yeah. And so if, 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 for example, I put a pizza between the two of us and, and you're hungry and I'm hungry, we're both hungry. And, and 
and I'm dominant, let's say, and I eat the whole pizza mm -hmm. and don't give you a slice, I know that you're going to be pissed off. I know that you will not forgive me, uh, not in the coming half hour, but also not in the coming days. You will, mm -hmm. you will be really uh, objecting to what I did. And um, if I want to keep a good relationship with you, and, and of course, in most human societies, we try to keep good relationships. If I want to keep a good relationship, I need to give you at least a slice or maybe half of it. Mm -hmm. yep. and, um, and I think that's what the chimpanzees realize. And, and I think that's where the sense of fairness comes from and why the reactions of chimpanzees are so similar to the reactions of humans in the ultimatum game, for example, which we use usually to test the sense of fairness, is that you can anticipate that if you take everything, uh, someone is going to be very upset with you. And so, so that's how I look at it, mostly in emotional terms and mostly, uh, mostly in terms of selfish interest. It's, it's in my interest to keep a good relationship with you. Um, and so uh, that's how I look at it, not as an empathy question, but more as a self-interest and cooperation question. And, and I, was, uh, I was disappointed to read in John Rawls' book that he tries to keep these emotions completely out of it. <laughs> which, which I think is counterproductive. Humans have emotions and emotions regulate our behavior in a very heavy way. Why would you throw them out? And why would you be um, trying to circumvent them like he was doing? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not a big admirer of John Rawls. I think, I think it's a beautiful written book. And uh, initially it may sound convincing, but it doesn't convince me at all. Yeah, actually, I had one question uh, about uh, Rawls. Actually, so let me uh, do a quote uh, 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 by you, and then I'll have my sort of short explanation, and then I wonder what you have to say okay. about this. So you state, Hobbes and Rawls create the illusion of human society as a voluntary arrangement with self-imposed rules assented to by free and equal agents. Yet, there never was a point at which we became social. Descended from highly social ancestors, a long line of monkeys and apes, we have been group living forever. Free and equal people never existed. Humans started out, if a starting point is discernible at all, as interdependent, bonded, and unequal. We come from a long lineage of hierarchical animals for which life in groups is not an option, but a survival strategy. So obviously, there's a lot of different claims uh, in here, uh, and I don't want to unpack all of them, but just to, to try to unpack uh, one thing. One thing that uh, I notice uh, you highlight, uh, uh, and I will try to just focus on Ross in particular, uh, uh, is sort of this original a position thought experiment that he's trying to do, right? Where we're exactly not thinking sort of about the uh, emotions. Um, so you sort of say at one point, right? Uh, 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 that this sociality, sociality is very important. Um, and that Rawls is sort of leaving that out. But I was wondering in some sense, like Rawls is concerned, right? With the uh, uh, social structure that we want to put in place for a society that seems to function, but it is addressing that sociality in a very non-social way in the sense of stripping away identities that embody that sociality. But yeah. he is still trying to get to that point of sociality. Do you see that point or do you think it's sort of invalid? Yeah, I don't know why people think that way. And I, and I think in the West, that is, of course, the illusion of the human male, the Western male. I don't think women think that way necessarily, but the, the, the man like to look at themselves as autonomous decision makers. Mm. Um, sort of like like John Wayne on his horse, you know, like oh, we 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 rule the world all by ourselves. Uh, all we have is our guns and our food, and uh, and, and 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 never a moment of vulnerability. Uh, even though when we're very young and when we're very old, Western men also need other people to mm -hmm. uh, to help them. Um, uh, but as long as you're young and healthy, uh, you, you can play that game of being an autonomous decision maker. Uh, but that that is not a position that jives very well with our biology. Our biology as social primates. We are intensely dependent on each other. We the biggest punishment we have apart from killing someone is, is solitary confinement. Yeah. And that is because we are intensely social beings. There's always mutual dependency. Um, and, and, and the more we learn from neuroscience at the moment, the more we learn also how our brains actually get in tune with the brains of others. Is mm -hmm. There are things happening in us when we are in contact with others that we don't even realize. We are completely sort of fusing with others in many ways. And so this idea of an autonomous human individual, which is, I think, a Western male illusion, 
uh, doesn't really correspond with anything that I understand about primate biology, uh, mm-hmm. because primates are intensely social beings and mm-hmm. do very poorly. Uh, so, so, for example, baboon males who, who move between groups, that's their most vulnerable time is when, when because the males are born in one group and they usually associate and later with another group. Mm-hmm. Um, the time that that at late puberty they move out and 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 try to join another group that's their vulner, most vulnerable time is we are not made to be alone we're not made to be loners we're we're, we're very poor at that and uh, i think that's a very long history in our primate biology and so yes the, the illusion that we are sort of autonomous decision makers uh, i think it's, it's totally ridiculous i don't know where it comes from and how we got that way but people think that way yeah so, so I'll try to get back to that point one more time later in the conversation, but like now maybe taking a, 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 another a sort of uh, ideal that you sketch related to sort of this notion of fairness, namely uh, uh, the three ideals of the French Revolution. So I found this also very fascinating, sort of your take uh, on that. So obviously liberty, equality and fraternity, uh, but you sort of conclude uh, 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 that by saying that morally speaking, fraternity is actually probably the, the noblest of the three, and also that there's a easiest to understand from a primate perspective, this, this, this notion of uh, fraternity. Um, so could you maybe provide your interpretation of these three ideals and then how uh, your research on primates is, is, is uh, 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 clarifying some of that ground? Yeah, liberty, um, uh, here, we, here we would say freedom. I think freedom is overrated. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, um, if, if, if you have a family, let's say your father or your mother of, of children, what is your freedom really? Is it, You're completely stuck. <laughs> Even if you have pets, you're already uh, stuck to some degree in the sense that your, your freedom is constrained. And, and if you live in a society as we all do, your freedom is constrained. And so, yeah, there is some degree of freedom, um, but um, I think freedom is overrated. I sometimes run into that when people say you shouldn't keep animals in zoos, animals need their freedom. And then I think, what is the freedom at the moment for let's say an orangutan in Borneo? We know that 100,000 orangutans have disappeared over the, last, uh, over the last 20 years. They've all been killed by farmers or by fires of the forest. Uh, is it so great to be free in the forest in Borneo at the moment? Maybe um, the, the, the orangutan is better off at the zoo, at a good zoo. Mm. Than, um, than in the forest in Borneo. But we always have this ideal of freedom. We, we think that's a wonderful thing to be free. Uh, and, and I think freedom is overrated. Uh, but I, I understand freedom of, of your the, making decisions in your own life. If that's what's meant by liberty, and I think the, the French probably meant that, mm. is that you need to be able to make your own decisions about what you do in your life. Yeah, some degree of freedom is obviously desirable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not completely against freedom, but I think freedom is uh, is is partly an illusion. Yeah. And then the point about fraternity, right? Like if you could just elaborate on that a little bit, like how that's like why is that the easiest to explain from like a primary? Well, fraternity relates to I think what we call in English fellow feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, it relates to being connected to the rest of society, feeling part of that society. Uh, I will help you, you will help me. Uh, reciprocity is part of that. Empathy is part of that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we, we are made for fraternity. Uh, uh, fraternity is, of course, the, the male version, but uh, yeah, we, we are made for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then maybe just taking a, a sort of a, a step back. Uh, so you, you also talk about a dilemma faced by behavioral science. And you, you say this, this can be summarized in, in two options that a behavioral scientist uh, can go, namely cognitive parsimony or evolutionary uh, parsimony, right? And this seems to actually be a point of sort of uh, 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 importance, like how you then spell out the rest of your story, where you sit on this uh, uh, dilemma. I think you clearly take the uh, evolutionary parsimony uh, 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 stance, which is very important for some of your uh, other arguments. Uh, but maybe yeah. you could just elaborate on this dilemma and, and yeah, how difficult it yeah. is. Yeah. That relates to the uh, the criticism that we used to get. It, it's, it's less common now, but but we always used to get criticism if we talked about cognition and consciousness and emotions in animals, um, that we are being anthropomorphic. That's the term that people used. Yeah. And and we are, we are comparing animals too easily with humans. That's what yeah. they would say. 
And with animals, they insist on simple explanations, the simplest possible Occam's razor, you know, that's the only thing we should do with animals. And so if you, if you say my animals can think ahead, they plan for the future, there's increasing evidence for this, uh, they would come up with explanations that maybe it was not based on that, maybe it was based on something else. You need to go with what they call the simpler explanations. Mm -hmm. That is cognitive parsimony. And as a biologist, I would say, no, that's not the, the best way to go. Is, is you need to, to, um, to take an evolutionary perspective, a Darwinian perspective, meaning that if an animal, if two animals are closely related, you need to have the same explanation for what they do. So if humans plan ahead and you can demonstrate that and you do the same sort of experiment on an animal and they show the same results, you have to call it planning ahead too, unless you can show that there's something different going on between the two. Um, but if you cannot demonstrate that, you go with a shared explanation for two related species. So, so for example, um, the fairness experiment that we did with the monkeys, where one monkey would object to getting less than the other one, um, people would say, you should not call that fairness. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because um, that, that's an anthropomorphism, you should not call it that way. But if you do the same experiment with children, and it has been done many times, yeah. you do the same with young children you get exactly the same reaction. The okay. kids object very emotionally also to getting less than somebody else. Mm -hmm. So my point of view would be if monkeys and children respond very similarly to similar circumstances, you have to come up with the same explanation for both because they are related. If they're unrelated, if you have, let's say humans and an octopus, I can see why you would maybe come up with different explanations for what they do, even, yeah. even if it looks superficially similar. But with related species, you always try to find a shared explanation and you don't worry too much about anthropomorphism. Uh, you worry more about uh, consistency in your thinking about how things may have evolved. And so, yeah, that's a very different approach. And so um, uh, I think it's the approach that's winning at the moment. At, at the moment, many people believe that um, we need to uh, have shared explanations for similar phenomena in humans and other species. But under, under the behaviorists, that was not really an acceptable position. And they went completely with, with the idea that in animals, it has to be simple. Mm -hmm. and, and one follow up, because uh, I was actually discussing this point about fairness and, and someone was indeed like pushing back saying, well, is that really the same notion that we're talking about? And then obviously you seem to hear illustrate, well, you know, if we look at children, right, and, and then we compare it, then if we see similar type of responses, then that's more parsimonious, evolutionarily speaking, to go with that conclusion. But if someone says, well, but here we have culture that starts to play a role. Here we get certain things institutionalized. Do you think it still makes sense to talk about the same notion or are we just transcending it so much now that we should at least clarify that in the discussion, right? And do you think, one of the things that I wonder sometimes is when you do transcend sort of more that uh, uh, notion uh, that is um, like sort of at base, right? Uh, um, uh, is that problematic? Like, is that going to be not harmonious with certain emotions and therefore potentially problematic when implemented? Like how far can you take that? Yeah, um, it makes me think, of course, fairness is a complex concept. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, it is possible that in humans, there are different things at play than in, in, in the monkeys. That's very well possible. But if you go to uh, things that are a bit simpler, when, for example, I, I first wrote about reconciliation in chimpanzees, they kiss and embrace after a fight, they kiss their opponent. Yeah. Uh, by calling that reconciliation, people said, why don't you call it post-conflict contact? Mm -hmm. And why don't you call the kiss mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact? They, they, they wanted me to move away from human terminology because they, they were not comfortable with human yeah. terminology. But I, I feel that if two chimpanzees kiss each other, they put their mouth on top of each other after a fight or when they greet each other, the circumstances are the same. Mm -hmm. the, the behavior is very similar. Uh, it's a closely related species. You have to give it the same term. Just as, as the hand, my, my human hand, we call this a hand, and the chimpanzee's, chimpanzee's hand is very similar. The stump is a little bit shorter, but for the rest, it's very similar. Mm 
you have to call it a hand. You cannot mm-hmm. call it a front yeah, paw. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you, you cannot move away from the human terminology just because you like that. No, uh, that, that's evolutionarily, that's completely wrong to do that. It's mm-hmm. a hand. They have a hand and I have a hand. Mm-hmm. And so with fairness, which is a complex phenomenon, it's possible that there are things in there uh, when humans uh, uh, demonstrate fairness. It's possible that there are things in there that we don't find in the chimpanzee. But my initial point would be, call it the same thing. And then if you find these differences, uh, I, I, I'm curious to hear about them. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I usually don't hear these fundamental differences. Yeah. And, and the same is true with culture. We use the term culture now, of course, for animals quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, there are aspects of human culture, for example, the symbolism. Humans mm-hmm. are a symbolic species. Mm-hmm. And so there are elements in human culture that we don't find in the chimpanzee, or, or at least some people say that they find them, but I think it's not very prominent in the chimpanzee. Um, but other, uh, other parts of culture, if culture is the transmission of knowledge and habits from yeah. one generation to the next without genes being involved, other aspects can be found in other species. And that's why we speak of culture now in other species. And, the, and it has become an acceptable term mm-hmm. in their case. So um, I, I'm very for continuity in our thinking, continuity in the terminology that we use and the concepts that we use to explain human behavior and animal behavior. Uh, and But if you can demonstrate the difference, if you can say, well, what these chimps are doing is really not the same thing as what we humans do, uh, well, well, then... We're going to be open to that that yeah, issue, yeah. of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, that, that's fair enough. So maybe you know you already uh, spoke about your dislike for for Rawls. So now we're going to try it with a student of Rawls. So with the prominent uh, Kantian philosopher like Christine Korsgaard, who is also responding uh, as one uh-huh. of the leaders in your book, uh, Primates and uh, Philosophers. And she has sort of taken uh, issue, and in the book she described it also uh, with the idea that non non-anim- uh, non human animals are motivated by self uh, interest. Uh, because she sort of says in order to make sense of this idea of self-interest, we would really need uh, or require a grip on the future and an ability to calculate uh, that does seem not uh, to be available to non-human uh, uh, animals. So that's what she sort of describes uh, in her essay there. Um, and then furthermore, acting for the sake for, of your best interest would require the capacity to be motivated by the abstract conception of your overall or long-term good. So do you think there's sort of an instability in that notion of self-interest uh, would you be on board with that or do you take issue with her stance? Oh, yeah. I, I do think animals can think ahead. And, and this discussion was like 20 years ago, no? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's long, <laughs> yeah, like it's a long time ago. I agree. Because we do have quite a bit of evidence for planning in animals now. Uh, in, in, not only in chimpanzees, but also in, in birds. So, so in corvids. So, so planning ahead... So, so the most simple example would be maybe making tools. You, you give, the, this has been done with parrots, I believe. You give them uh, cardboard and they can strip the cardboard, making sticks out of that, that they use to break in food, for example. In order to make a tool that is suitable for the situation, there's some creativity involved, but also some thinking ahead involved. And, and of course, in the wild, you may see chimpanzees pick up tools and travel for miles with the tools and then use them at a different location where, where the termites are or where the bees are or what, yeah. whatever they need the tools for. Yeah. Uh, and in captivity, people have done experiments with apes where they give them a tool. They give them a choice, actually, between an immediate reward a tool that they can use uh, right away and a tool that they can use tomorrow to get something much better. And and they, some of them, not all the time, but some of them pick that tool that they can use tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Meaning that they prefer uh, waiting and and holding on to that tool till that occasion arises, which they have learned about, uh, than the immediate award. And Mm -hmm. so thinking ahead is really not... um, it's not impossible. I, I think certainly the crows and, and the primates do that, but, but I wouldn't be surprised if other animals do that as well. And I'm, I'm not talking here about just instinctive uh, thinking ahead, like let's say a squirrel who hides nuts in the fall and then eats them in the spring or in the winter mm-hmm. uh, is, is showing behavior that, that offer benefits later on mm-hmm. 
but I'm not sure that the squirrel knows that, that I'm not sure that the squirrel is thinking ahead because even, even a first year squirrel who has never been in these circumstances will do this kind of thing. Now in the primates and in the corvids, these studies, they indicate really thinking ahead. And so in that sense, I think course guard, uh, she made an assumption, which was which was the wrong assumption. I think about animals that animals cannot think ahead. Yeah. yeah so th that was one part of the equation, then, right? And then the other one seems to be where she's trying to get a grip on this abstract conception of your overall or long term good. So there, it might just be how do like sort of how unified is this uh, 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 planning ahead? <laughs> uh, uh, that might be a, a second part that. that I'm trying to argue, like sort of from her perspective, I'm not sure if she would say that, but that seems to be sort of another- I, I don't know what that would be. It's a sort of abstract concept of your good. Exactly, she thinks that's sort of instable. Exactly, she would, I think, take issue with that as well, where saying, well, to come up with really, that, that's where people would argue, for example, against like an egoist, that at one point that sort of becomes self-contradictory because it's not that clear what type of strategy would even uh, promote that type of good because it will very quickly collapse. <laughs> so that there's some inherent instability in this notion, but uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can leave it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, uh, maybe uh, um, um, like, um, Going, I guess uh, that was one interesting point because obviously you you do take issue uh, with what you call sort of morality from a top down perspective, right? And then you mentioned usually uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, 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 you know, being one example where sort of these moral laws get uh, imposed, or you sometimes uh, talk about sort of uh, religious uh, uh, value uh, systems. Well, well you... let me let me give another example. Is that um, because you brought up the French Revolution mm -hmm. uh, at some point? We, we got one time a letter from um, a colleague who said it was impossible for our monkeys to have a sense of fairness because fairness and justice were invented during the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that is what I would consider a top-down view, is that before the French Revolution, we did not know about fairness. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we humans, we had no clue. But then some old guys there in Paris, they came up with the notion of justice and fairness. And all of a sudden, we all believed in it. And, and, and that, for me, is such a strange way of thinking, is that um, our moral principles come from thinkers. No, they don't come from thinkers. The, the thinkers may be very good in formulating them. They may be very good in justifying them. Uh, they may be good in um, adding a narrative to them so that we better understand them. And religion does that too. Religion adds narratives to our moral uh, uh, decisions. But I don't think the, these moral decisions are made by some old guys in Paris. They, they, they are ingrained in the human species in many yeah. ways. Now that's interesting. I was reading like a historian of the Enlightenment and, and that person does talk exactly about the revolution of the mind. <laughs> so he does say that sort of these revolutions in ideas, but that's exactly what you're sort of taking uh, uh, issue yeah, yeah, uh, with. Yeah. So, so one other, but you mentioned one comment, which, which I find very interesting. So it, I, I'm quoting you here. Uh, you state moral laws are mere approximations, perhaps metaphors of how we should behave, that the underlying values can be internalized to the point that we end up with an autonomous conscience, is something that, as Kant observed, should fill us with wonder, because how this happens is barely understood. So I find it very interesting, because here you seem to sort of uh, 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 agree with a, a, a um, certain amount of like utility in still talking about moral laws, right? While you say, well, we have to watch out, we can't interpret it as what you just described in the case of the French Revolution. There is something there to be spoken of. <laughs> Am uh, I maybe misinterpreting you or would you? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I think it's still a puzzle how we internalize these things. <laughs> and. and um... You, you can you can teach a dog um, not to take food, and, and people have done these experiments where you you tell a dog you're not allowed to eat from this bowl. There's interesting food there. Then you leave the room, and a camera films the dog. How long does the dog sit next to the bowl? Yeah. And there are dogs who will indeed not eat the food, but there are many other dogs who, as soon as you leave, <laughs> they mm, they yeah. eat the food. Uh, but it means that there are some dogs who internalize these rules mm -hmm. and they, um, even when the risk of punishment is low, mm -hmm. uh, will, will follow these rules. And I think that's what we humans do in our conscience is that we, um, we internalize the rules of our society to such a degree that even when there's no one present uh, and no punishment is forthcoming, mm 
we will still follow these rules. Now, we also know that humans fail at this very often. You see that with politicians who, who get caught doing something bad and then all of a sudden regret it. Uh, but you know that otherwise they would never have regretted it. Yeah. So I say, I say human, humans are very imperfect in this, in this internalization. But we, we do have an internalization so that we feel bad uh, even when, when no one is watching and no one is doing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a <laughs> remarkable fact, I suppose, that uh, uh, still needs to get explained. But maybe uh, shifting to, uh, uh, you, you also talk about, uh, and this is focusing on uh, moral emotion. So you talk about Westermark's work uh, and how he sort of focuses on uh, defining uh, moral emotions as moral. Um, and, and here you say, uh, and, and I quote, uh, they differ from kindred non-moral emotions by their disinterestedness. Uh, in, apartment uh, impartiality and flavor of generality. So could you maybe just describe the, the importance of uh, uh, his work and what you sort of take from it? Yeah, the, um, I'm not sure that I agree with that view, is okay. the disinterestedness. Mm. But um, I think what he, he, he feels that the rules are abstracted from your ego interests, so to speak. Yeah. And um, if you follow rules that are purely in your own interest, we would not necessarily call that a moral rule. If, if, if you, um, I, I think it had to do with his definition. Westermark was a very interesting character. He was an anthropologist, Swedish Finn. Um, and he lived in a time where he was interested in these principles. He, he was, for example, interested in incest mm. and uh, the Westermark rule for incest. And um, he lived in a time that Freud had all sorts of ideas about incest and why we avoided it and how we sublimated uh, our desire for the opposite sex parent and things like that. And Westermark was always pushed to the side. He was not as important as Freud, clearly. But in the end, I think Westermark was right uh, that we have a sort of natural tendency to avoid incest. That's what mm -hmm. he would say. Mm -hmm. Maybe one thing that you seem to highlight, and this was very interesting when talking about a specific duty, so the duty of loyalty. And so many people would sort of argue that, you know, we are biased. That's sort of a, a fact uh, that we are biased uh, in favor of sort of the innermost circle. So obviously ourselves, <laughs> but also our family, our community, and then also our species. So it's kind of uh, expanding. Uh, however, you also argue that we ought to be <laughs> uh, uh, in favor of this sort of uh, uh, duty of uh, loyalty. And you think it would be very strange to not sort of respect uh, that uh, duty. So that would sort of lead to the question, well, sure, like if we take sort of this, this uh, 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 loyalty to be a duty, right? Like how does that fit within our larger hierarchy of uh, duties? And when do we reconcile this tension that it also seems to create uh, between other duties, uh, moral duties that one uh, um, might hold? Yeah, I, I use that as an argument uh, when I talk about utilitarianism. Uh, yeah. The, the greater good of the greater number of people, yeah. <laughs> which to me is, is, a, is a very odd principle um, because we are not made that way and, and we're not supposed to be that way. Um, if, if, if let's say there's a famine and, and I find food in the street, I find a bread in the street and I have a family at home, I have kids at home and a wife at home. I have to bring that food to my family. I, 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 of course, the greater good of the greater number of people, I could hand it out to anyone in the street that would be fine and everyone would be very happy with it. But I feel an obligation to bring it first to my family. I have my first obligation is my own family. And so um, utilitarianism by ignoring these commitments that we have to our friends and our family uh, commitments based on reciprocity with our friends and commitments based on blood relations with our family. Um, by ignoring that, I think, I think that is a terribly anti-biological way of looking at society. We did not evolve that way and, and we're not supposed to act that way. I think, I think people would be very offended if they knew that I could have fed them and I didn't feed them if they're close to me. So, um, uh, these are non-biological principles of morality yeah. um, that maybe have some advantages under some circumstances. Uh, I agree with that. But um, in general, I think they don't fit the way we, we have been psychologically built.
Yeah, and I think that might lead to a, a, another important uh, point that you seem to make quite a lot, right? Which is talking about human nature. So some people want to actually shy away. They think, you know, can we really make, and you know, some people would accuse you of like essentialist claims uh, about human nature that they deem uh, uh, unstable. But for you, and it seems to be an important uh, starting point, like what is our human nature? How can we give uh, a substance uh, to uh, that notion? And, and you say also at one point, right, you're very suspicious or deeply suspicious of any restructuring of uh, human nature. And that does seem to also uh, 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 show up, for example, in what we just discussed with regards to the principle of utilitarianism, that sure, we can set certain ideals, but if there's really this inherent tension that goes against certain of our biological traits, then we ought not to take uh, 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 that um route so so maybe you could you could say something about like why this deep suspicion as well about restructuring it like do you think yeah. it's a historical case to be made or is it really a purely sort of like evolutionary psychological uh, psychological argument that is at play yeah human nature of course is a term that is thrown around freely by everyone all the time and and even as a biologist i would say it, it's certainly not etched in stone what human nature is mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it's not like uh, it will never change and it's immutable or something, or, or that is even something that is clearly defined. Mm. But I think certain aspects of human nature, we, we can certainly, for example, um, the mother-child bond, which is a mammalian phenomenon, it's not just a human, it's a mammalian thing, is absolutely strong and you have to respect it. And, and every society will have to respect it. When in the kibbutz in Israel, they try to disrespect it by setting up cooperative breeding facilities, so to speak, by, by having the kids dissociated from the family and play together and as if there was no human family. The, the parents were involved, but, but it was not like they could privilege their kids or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that that collapsed. They couldn't maintain that because people felt very unhappy that they had, did not have the kids close to them when they slept at night or some things like that. Yeah. So, so you you can you cannot set up a society that ignores the mother-child bond, and uh, and since fathers in in the human species are very much involved also in family life, probably also not the father-child bond, uh, yeah. although that's of course done much more commonly. Um, but the mother-child bond needs to be respected. And so there are other aspects of human nature, so to speak, um, that you need to respect in your social system and in your moral system. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that you can never get around them or that, that it's sort of cast in stone, that it has always to be represented and to be respected. Um, that there's always exceptions to all these, these situations. Yeah. Um, but I think in general, you, you need to um, understand that there are certain things that, that you, for example, humans are hierarchical. We are hierarchical primates. Um, and so you, you can try to set up a completely egalitarian society. And people have done that. There have been communes when I was young. There were communes where, which were supposedly free of jealousy and free, free of hierarchy. Um, but they haven't lasted. Mm. And, and so, yeah, you can, you can try to do that and you, you can certainly try to diminish the effect of the hierarchy or to, to mitigate it, um, but you will never get a human society that is uh, totally non-hierarchical, completely egalitarian. So if you read, for example, on egalitarianism, there are books by Chris Bohm, an anthropologist who studies the, these egalitarian societies. And he says, they have to work very hard on being egalitarian. And, and that is because humans have a tendency for hierarchy. And so they, they have to undermine the position of the top, the top guy, the, usually a man who tries to be the dominant man. And they, they sometimes um, have to bring him down. And in addition, these egalitarian societies, they are only egalitarian among the men. Uh, there's always a gender difference in, in the power. And uh, so, so to call them egalitarian is already very misleading mm -hmm. because they're not fully egalitarian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I, there are certain things in, in human psychology and human biology that no moral system can get around, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's an interesting point. And, and maybe shifting topics a little bit, uh, you have an interesting discussion uh, in, in your books when you talk about mirror tests. So I know this is a bit of a shift, but uh, when you also give the example of like dolphins, elf, uh, elephants, so 
maybe you could say a word about what these mirror tests are and like why they are relevant. Uh, you talk about the co-emergency hypothesis. So could you just run us through like this test uh, and, and sort of what these tests uh, tell us? Well, the, the initial test um, done on chimpanzees uh, and done on young children also is um, that you can, by looking at the mirror, you can make a connection with yourself. So, so you put a mark on, on the kid, it's called a mark test. You put a mark that they don't know about and you put them in front of a mirror. If they look at the mirror image and they start to touch the mark, meaning, meaning that they connect the mirror image with themselves, it's called a test of self-awareness, even though many people are now objecting mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's sort of an implication that animals who cannot do this, which are many animals, Mm -hmm. uh, have no self-awareness, mm -hmm. uh, whereas mm -hmm. others would say that even plants may have self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> maybe you don't even need the brain to be self-aware. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, more typically, we call it mirror self-recognition. And uh, initially, this was only found in apes and humans. And so a very sharp distinction was made. Apes and humans are hominids. Monkeys are not hominids. Monkeys have tails and, and are a different kind of primate. So the hominids have self-awareness or at least recognize themselves in the mirror and all the other animals know. Now that, that picture has started to crumble now because we have now evidence for certain birds like magpies, dolphins, elephants. I was involved in the elephant study. Uh, and there's now a fish study that, <laughs> that is challenging uh, these things. And so the, this idea that hominids are special um, because they have mirror self-recognition um, is, is not so popular anymore. And, and I'm arguing for a more gradualist perspective where we look at self-awareness as, as something that emerges. Also in human de development, uh, it, it, it doesn't come up because kids start to recognize themselves in the mirror when they're 18 months to 24 months old. Mm -hmm. It's not as if before that time they had zero self-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard to imagine. Uh, and so um, I, I'm, I'm now for a more gradualist perspective where you say, okay, it emerges very slowly. Also in evolution, it, it, it emerges slowly and it has many facets that we still don't know because the mirror test is a very limited kind of test and is a very visual test that doesn't apply very well to animals who rely on other senses. So it's, yeah. so dogs, for example, uh, or elephants for that matter, we, we tested elephants on the mirror, uh, but elephants are of course uh, much better equipped for olfaction than for vision. And mm -hmm. so maybe the elephants also need a different kind of test. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like if I remember correctly, this, these sort of experiments, right, are helpful for making the like self other distinction, which then leads into some of these other uh, characteristics relevant for morality, right? Just to make that yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's probably connected with um, theory of mind at some point. Is that mm -hmm. you can take the perspective of somebody else, but all of that is very vague at the moment. That, that mm -hmm. connection okay. is is certainly not well established. I would say it's it's sort of speculative connection. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a final question, you obviously like trust is seen by many also as an, a potentially important ingredient uh, for a, a, a sort of a, a social uh, stability, uh, I suppose. And, and you give uh, some interesting examples where you talk about trust games. So could you maybe just tell a bit about what those trust games are and, and what they show us? So yeah, trust, trust is important because it, it is the predictability of the behavior of the other. Uh, can, for example, if, if, if you're a, a chimpanzee male and you want to challenge the alpha male and you have a friend who's helping you, a coalition partner, you need to, um, to be very trusting because mm -hmm. if you challenge the alpha male and your friend doesn't show up and your friend stays out of it, you're in deep doo-doo. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's why trust is, is a matter of life and death sometimes. Can, mm -hmm. I, can I trust my partner to help? help me or not. And that's why, for example, chimpanzees test this out. They, mm -hmm. they, a, a, a challenging male in a chimpanzee society will provoke the alpha male regularly to see how others respond. And if his friend is always by his side when he's doing that, until one day he's, he's really going to challenge him. And, and he, has, he, he has then built up enough trust with the other one to do that. So, so trust is a very important uh, issue. Uh, can I, 
can I trust that you help me? For example, mother apes always help their kids and their kids trust them for that. They, they, they count on that. Uh, and so uh, trust is very important. And trust is probably tested in primates. There's a very interesting observation of capuchin monkeys in Costa Rica, where they have what is called trust games, is where um, two, two monkeys will sit together in the tree and they will stick their fingers up their noses with each other, or sometimes even in the eyeball, in the eye, uh, stick their fingers and they have to sit very still because otherwise it's a very dangerous business that they're doing. They have to sit very still and the other one has to not do odd things with their fingers. Uh, and, and so these are called trust games. And uh, when Susan Perry reported that for the first time, no one could believe it. And, and, and people actually did not believe that this was going on until she videotaped it. And she videotaped uh, these interactions. And then people started to believe that it really happened. Uh, and she, she thinks it is a way of these monkeys to build trust with each other. So you're, you're a partner that I can trust and I work with you. Uh, uh, and, and so um, trust is, uh, I think, an underestimated issue in the relationships of primates. But we now have several uh, experimental studies of it. Oh, that's fascinating. So, Professor De Waal, thank you so much for uh, your time. I really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.